I'm Diana Jones, and I would like to thank you for worshiping with us today. We're so glad you've joined us. If you are new with us, we want to connect with you and answer any questions you might have. So please fill out the card found in the seat back pocket in front of you and take it to the information desk in the foyer. You can also find someone wearing a gray Stonegate t-shirt to answer any questions you may have. Right now, we want to share a few ways you can get involved here at Stonegate. In a couple of weeks, Stonegate Men is taking dads and sons to Arlington for a Rangers game. Sign up for $90 in Stonemark today. That'll cover transportation and a ticket in the all-you-can-eat section. Baptism class is next Sunday morning at 11. All ages meet in Building D. We have an additional evening class at 5 for kids. All kids who attend the baptism class must have a parent or guardian with them. You don't have to sign up for the class. Just show up. We're excited to announce a new tool for everyone who's part of Stonegate Fellowship. Right now, media is like Netflix, but with Bible studies. When you sign up, you get access to thousands of videos, printouts, kids' resources, and more. You can access it anywhere you have an internet connection, and it's even available on your computer, phone, and tablet. This opens up tons of possibilities for your small groups. So go to StonegateFellowship.com to find out how and sign up for free, or stop by the adults desk in the foyer if you have any questions. Men's and women's large group Bible studies are in full swing. Both meet Wednesdays. Men's morning Bible study meets in Building F at 6.30 in the morning. You'll be finished by 7.15, so you'll have plenty of time to get to work. Stonegate Women's at Dusk group meets at 7 Wednesday evenings upstairs in the Stonegate Kids Building. This week, we'll hear from the Executive Director of Thrive Ministry, a group dedicated to serving the women who serve the body of Christ globally. This is a great time to join Stonegate Women and learn about some of the different ways we support women in our community and around the world. Childcare is available for this group every week, so join us Wednesday. And if you have any questions about anything you've heard today, please don't hesitate to ask. Head out to the information desk or log on to StonegateFellowship.com. And if you're on social media, be sure and look for us. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope you're okay. My name is Tyler, one of the worship pastors here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, how about this weather? Everybody loving it? It's finally cool. It's so great. Um, Hey, if you're new with us, we do just want to reinforce, we're glad that you're here. Uh, please fill out a card in the seat back in front of you, as Dustin's already said on the video, and uh, take it to our information desk. We'd love to connect with you. Um, as we get started today, we're going we're gonna to sing some songs about Jesus and about God, who he is and who we are in him, and uh, Patrick will be up later um, speaking today. And so, but as we get going, I'd ask you just to stand with me and... Um, you know, as you know, you come to the 11 o'clock service, it's pretty full in here. So if there's any room in between you, please scoot in. Um, it just helps our ushers uh, get people in as they're coming in. Um, and so as we get going, I just love for us to stop and take a moment and pray and uh, set our hearts and minds just uh, on God and, and on his truths today. We, let's just pray. God, we love you so much. We thank you. For your goodness and your mercy, we thank you that you uh, will forever reign. We thank you that you've included us in your uh, story and advancing your kingdom. And so, God, I ask you just to uh, to fill this place today, God. I know you are with all of us, but as we, as your people, here in this place that we call Stonegate Fellowship, worship you, God. I pray that you're near. We ask you to do a work and change us in our hearts. God, I pray you bring healing where healing needs to be brought. God, that we would understand the more of the depths of your love today as we reflect on you and on the cross and what you've done and who you are. I thank you this day for all these things. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Let's just sing about the gospel this morning. The moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun was dead. The Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross his blood poured out for us the weight of every curse upon
final breath he gave As heaven looked away The Son of God was laid in darkness A battle in the grave The war on death was waged The power of hell forever broken The ground began to shake rolled away His perfect love could not be overcome yeah. Now death where is your sting Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated Forever He is glorified Forever together His name, 
Into the darkness and into the darkness you shine. And out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. And our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than it. Some power I got, I got. We see it again. Yeah, I got.
Let our praise rise today. We confess this truth together. If He is for us, and if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand redemption to us he is a God who can heal who can bring salvation to this lost and broken world our broken hearts and so we stand in that today this free gift that Jesus has given us and um, as we just think about that and focus on God I'd love to just sing that chorus again together really believing that he is greater, he is stronger than I think a lot of us really pay attention to or realize in our lives. So let's just make this confession. And our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome and power. Thank you for your, uh, your grace today. God, the abundant supply of yourself for the need of the moment. And we as a church, we confess that we need you every hour. And we thank you that you come quickly to that need through your spirit. And so God, we ask you to change us as we participate in truth today and as we worship I thank you for meeting with us and may what we do be pleasing to you just bless this time as we give and continue to seek truth God in your name I pray amen you can have a seat Oh, the author 
of our salvation Behold the wonder of grace so free Behold the blessing of true forgiveness I cry
Well, good morning. It's great to see you here and uh, just standing in the back watching uh, everybody come in and just uh, honored that you would be here. We have about, uh, last week was our first service for Odessa and we had uh, 502 people there for the first service in Odessa. So um, if you want to sit in a place not so crowded, you can go to Odessa or uh, we have a five o'clock and a seven o'clock service as well. So I hope it's been a good weekend for you. I think um, all the right football teams won, unless you're a Red Raider and uh, you got problems. But anyways, if you're a guest with us, that's the topic every Sunday from now until December. So uh, get over it. Anyways, I, uh, it's great to have you here. Um, a little bit of a different direction. I um, kind of had everything all planned out. As you know, usually if you're here in the summertime, which most of Midland is not, if you're here in church in the summertime, I'm gone for a few weeks usually and usually try to spend that time and study and figure out a direction to go. And um, over the last few weeks, the Lord has pretty much just said, I appreciate your time and study. I mean, it wasn't a conversation we had, but uh, uh, he's really changed some directions. And the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about idols and... Um, this morning, I had everything ready to go until this morning, um, and I, I sense that maybe there's something else the Lord would want us to press in on. So I'm going to ask for you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 139, uh, Psalm 139, and uh, we're going to try to get as far as we did in the first hour this morning, and then we'll pick up next week and see how far we can go in the next week after that. Um, I noticed there are a lot of kids in the auditorium, and I know this may sound very mean, but uh, if your children uh, decide that they want to have fun, please make that up happen in the lobby uh, rather than in here, so we won't be distracted by that. Well, so I won't be. Let's just be frank about it. Uh, I do love children, have my own, and um, so don't leave here and go, he just doesn't like children. No, just not yours. So anyways, I, I <laughs> that was wrong. I hear people oftentimes talk about revival, that we need a revival in our land. And oftentimes when I hear people say we need a revival in our land, I, I wonder what they mean by that. I wonder what, what they mean by that is we need everybody who's not a Christian to start acting like one. I wonder if they, what they mean by that is we need people who do all the bad things out there to start doing good things. Uh, that we need um, a better culture, a better society, all, no, all of these things. I, no one would disagree with. I wouldn't disagree with either. But is that revival? Is revival that everybody starts acting like Christians? Because if that's revival, you're not going to find in the Bible where that's ever going to happen until Jesus comes back and there's a new heaven and a new earth. But I wonder if revival, maybe you've never heard that word, maybe you're new to the church world and you've never heard people cry out or pray for revival or renewal, but what if revival and renewal were something that was really reserved for followers of Jesus and what God was doing in our lives and pushing in on, on our lives and working on us and getting us ready to be on display for even greater works? The reason I started thinking about this and the reason things started changing this last week was I was in an elder meeting. If, if you're new to our church, we have elders in our church body. Um, it's not run by a body of deacons. It's not run by me. We have elders who oversee our congregation. And I was in that meeting, and it was Monday night, and we were talking about the future. What would the Lord want Stonegate to do for the future? We have the Odessa campus now, and, and what's the Lord asking us to do? And in today's culture of the Permian Basin, it seems like the answer to everything is always, well, let's just take up all the money we can from people who are making a lot now, and let's try to build big buildings, and, and let's make our church bigger, and all those different things. And and there was a moment of, well, a moment lasted about three hours of pause in our meeting as we began to say, what if, what if that's not of the Lord? What if that's not the big thing? What if the big thing is something a little bit different? What if the big thing isn't so big, but maybe something different that quite literally might sound impossible to us? One of our elders who's been with us since the founding of this church said, I remember listening to a sermon at Abel, and I wonder, 
When you asked us back then if we would be ready for the impossible, what's the impossible thing that God's asking of us? What's the impossible thing he's asking of you? And then another elder, and and you always hope that people listen to your messages, but then you really don't. I mean, because they remind you of what you said. You ever had anybody do that? It's quite frustrating. And um, one of our elders said, this was last Monday, he said, Patrick, three weeks ago, you preached a message out of Mark chapter six, and you asked us a question. And he quoted it verbatim, he, so he wasn't winging it. He said, he said, you said, are any of us hanging it out there so far that if the Lord doesn't come through, we fail? And, and I said, I, I remember that, I don't think it was quite accurate. But anyways, uh, he said, what are we doing as a church that's so far out there that if God doesn't come through, we fail? And so that brought me to Psalm 139. So I've asked you to already open your Bibles to Psalm 139 and, and to a prayer that I think is a prayer that is the beginning of God doing things in our lives that are above and beyond what we could ever hope or imagine. Now let me, let me set things up here a little bit and I hope you have your Bibles open to Psalm 139 because if you go to the very first verse, let me just run you through this pretty quick so you can see kind of what's happening. David begins and he says, Lord, you've searched me and you've known me and you know when I sit down, you know when I get up, you know my thoughts from afar. And and he he goes through about six verses of basically reminding himself that, Lord, you know me. And the Lord does know us. He knows us deeply. He knows me deeply. He knows the parts of me that you don't know. He knows the parts of you that I don't know. He knows the parts of us that we don't want anyone to know. You know those parts I'm talking about? The parts that, as a friend of mine says, everybody's got a junk drawer, and um, I don't want anybody messing with that drawer. And have you ever had anybody come to your house, and you know, you've, you've just started to be friends, but they open doors or open a cabinet or do something like, who gave you permission to open that door? Anybody have had that person come over? Yeah, I have. And, um, and it, it's great. I mean, I'm glad they're doing that. But you know, there's just a part of you that says, that wasn't meant for you to be in. And that's Sort of the way the Lord is sometimes. He knows me and, and, and he knows you deeply. We'll talk about that some more. Then you go to verse seven and I'm really trying to get us all the way to the end of the chapter. But he says, Lord, you search me or where shall I go from your spirit in verse seven? Where, where am I gonna flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is really a word for the grave, you're there. Basically, he says, I can go anywhere. I can try to hide anywhere, but you'll find me and, and you see me. There's nowhere you can go from the Lord, it's true in my life, it's true in yours. I don't care how dark you're dark or how light you're light. There's nowhere you can go that he is not with us. And then the verses we read quite a bit in verse number 13, that you form my inward parts and you knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And he, he reminds us the Lord has a plan for us. He, he does have a plan for us. And then you get to verse 17. And he says, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God. I love these. I'm going to slow down right here, but I love this verse. Let's read it again. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. And when I wake up, I'm still with you. I want you to think about that for a minute. It's just introduction before we get to the verses I want to look at, but I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else this morning, remember that the Lord your God thinks of you. There is not a moment that you breathe that the Lord is not thinking of you. The best way David could say it was he said, it's like if I had all the sand and I could just hold it, it still wouldn't number your thoughts for me. And I want to tell those of you who think he's not thinking of you, that in the seasons when it feels like God has checked out on you, those are probably the seasons where God is most at work around you and in you. You see, in your life and in my life, we're typically in one of two seasons, a season of preparation or a season of action and obedience. Some of you are in a season right now where you have trusted the Lord and you are obeying him and part of that obedience was maybe moving here to the Permian Basin. Some of you feel like you're in a complete state of nothing happening. God feels so far away. It's like a winter time of your soul and God is preparing you. But understand, no matter the season, no matter the place, God is thinking of you. 
in the season when you feel like he has disregarded you, there is not a neutral moment in your life where God checks out and then checks back in and goes, I'm so sorry, I hadn't been thinking about you in a while. How you doing? That can't happen. I hope you'll just think about that a little. I, I'm saying it over and over and over again. But he says, when I woke up this morning, you were thinking about me. He did not need an alarm clock. I do not have a, an appointment with him. My appointment with his thoughts is always, think about that. And that is an appointment he keeps even when I am not doing what's right. That is an appointment he keeps when I'm doing what's right. There is no moment of your life that God is not preciously thinking about you. We'll dig into that some more, but he says, Lord, you, you are thinking of me. Now, skip down to verse 23. And this is where we'll be for the next couple of weeks or whenever we're done. So verse 23 I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to have to do some more foundational work. So you're going to have to look up some other scripture. But this is where we'll be for the rest of the time. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, I've got to set a foundation for you that'll help make this passage make a little more sense. So in order to do that, we've got to go look up some other scripture, Okay. So if you've got your Bibles with you, which I'm hoping you do by now, go to the New Testament to the book of Romans, okay? So go to the book of Romans. If you're not familiar with your Bible, go to the table of contents and look it up. I'll just go there right now so we all feel good together. There's a place called the New Testament. You go on down, there's a book called Romans. My Bible, it's page 939. So uh, don't know where it is with yours, but find Romans. And then you're going to, you're going to want to find Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. So David is praying for the Lord to search him. And we will dig in a little more about that. But before we can dig in, we've got to see what's happening in your life and in my life spiritually. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, this applies to you. If you are not a follower of Jesus, this whole Christianity thing is new to you. You don't even know if you like it, much less accept it. You're just here listening. Then just listen, okay? I hope you'll... you'll uh, come to a place where you want to know Jesus as Savior. But for those of you, I'm not talking to Baptists, Methodists, Catholics, Presbyterians, Church of Christ. I'm not talking to Christers. Those are people that go to church on Christmas and Easter. I'm talking to people who, um, who know Jesus. Okay, like you, you, have, you have prayed and, and he's come into your life and saved you. You've made a confession. I'm not talking about your baptism. I'm talking about you know Jesus as Savior. To say it another way, you know that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. You know him as Savior. I'm talking to you, okay? Now, Romans chapter 8, make your way down to verse 9. Verse 9. This is a description of you as a follower of Jesus. That, and I use the word follower of Jesus more often than I do the name Christian because people, um, when you ask them if they're Christians, especially in West Texas, they say, well, yeah, I am or something like that. It's rarely, while well, certainly, it's usually like, you bet you. So, Romans 8, verse 9, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells inside of you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Then he, he, again, he's kind of making a, a roundabout argument to tell you this, verse 10. But if Christ is in you, and Christ is in you if you've called out to Jesus for salvation. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, so outwardly we're, we're dying, we're wasting away, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now hang on, don't get lost here. Verse 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Now let me pause for a minute. We're talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. You've probably heard that referred to as possibly the Trinity. Okay? So he's telling you a part of that God personality, that God person, that God the Spirit is inside of you as a follower of Jesus. Let's keep going. Verse 11, if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that means makes his home in you, abides in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, don't get lost in that and don't go, I have no idea what he just read. 
rather, rather than do that, move over to 1 Corinthians. So you're in Romans. All you got to do is turn the page a little bit. Okay, there's 16 chapters in Romans. So turn the page until the next door neighbor of Romans is 1 Corinthians, all right? And find chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Give you a chance to find it. This is going to get a little confusing. So I'm going to give you a chance to find it. Then I want you to pause. And if you're taking notes, I'm going to give you three scriptures to write down. Okay, we're not going to look them up. I'm going to give you three scriptures to write down. If you're a long timer at Stonegate, you've heard me mention these scriptures. And here they are. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. I just write 2C122. 2 Corinthians 1.22 and 5.5. If you're, I would encourage you to write them down if you're a skeptic, so you can go back and read them and see if I'm telling you the truth. 2 Corinthians 1, 22 and 5, 5, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. So again, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, and then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. All three of those verses say the same thing. They say the following. They say that God has placed his spirit inside of you as a follower of Jesus, kind of like, like took you apart when he saved you and put his spirit inside of you, put you back together and sealed you up and nothing can take the spirit of Christ out of you. In fact, the word that's literally used there in 2 Corinthians and in Ephesians is the word earnest money. And it says he has put his spirit in you as a promise that he will come and finish his work or come back and get you. So if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the part I'm trying to drive to that will lay the foundation. You have inside of you the spirit of Christ, the same spirit or Holy Spirit. If you grew up in a, uh, maybe a church that called him the Holy Ghost. So you ever heard that? Anybody ever heard that? Usually it was said something like this, the Holy Ghost or something like that. Okay. So the same thing, Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, Holy Ghost is placed inside of you, sealed up. It's a down payment and you can't get rid of it. That's inside of you. And it's the same powerful spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, but there's more to it. I want to show you something. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 finds your way to verse 9. Okay, it's kind of in the middle of a paragraph. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I used to quote that verse as my favorite verse. And I would quote it because I think you can't even imagine what God is going to do in your life, which is only partly true. Because watch what happens here. Verse 10. These things, what things? What eye has seen, what ear has not heard, nor the heart of man imagined. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So again, the Spirit is working inside of you by the work of God to show you things and do things in your life you could never even imagine. It's going to take us back to the prayer of David, but let's at least see this. Look at the rest of verse 10. For the Spirit searches everything. Now watch this. Even the depths of God. So the Spirit of God, that is God, that knows God, lives inside of you, and you're going to see a little bit later, also knows you, and is where the work of God takes place in your life. I would expect at this point in the message, you're kind of going, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Which if you don't, that's great. Let's keep going, because I'm going to work towards hopefully making some sense. Verse 11, for who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of of that person which is in him. And that's right, right? I mean, you and I can have a conversation and I think you're telling me what you're thinking, but there's a good chance you're not telling me what you're thinking. You know what I'm talking about? You know, you can be in a conversation and kind of be talking but not be in it, right? Because your mind operates so fast. Surely I'm not the only one who does that. Okay, just making sure. Because there's a lot of women out there going, yeah, absolutely, all the time. And there's a lot of men going, you don't want to be in that conversation. So... For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person that's in him? Watch this. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Watch. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but we have received the spirit who is from God so that we can understand the things freely given us by God. He, he's literally telling us 
by the work of his spirit inside of us, he wants to show us things. He wants to reveal to us things. He wants to do things in our lives that your eye could not have possibly seen, your ear could never have heard, your heart could never have imagined, but it will require a prayer that we're going to look into in just a minute. So let's go back to Psalm 139 and let's begin to pour into this because what I needed you to see before we poured into Psalm 139, if you're a follower of Jesus, there is a an activity taking place inside of you. I keep kind of pointing to the center of my being because, and I'll show you here in just a minute, there is a work of God in your heart and a work of God in my heart. And I submit to you that through this prayer that we're about to study, a revival can occur, and it's not a revival that's gonna make everybody out there change. It'll be a revival that changes all of us from the inside out. And if we begin a change, from the Lord Jesus Christ, only then can culture begin to see that it's worth it. So let's go to Psalm 139, go to verse 23, and I'll take you through this over the next couple of weeks, and I hope that by the end of this morning, you'll begin with me praying this prayer in your own life. So let's begin. Verse 23, David says this, search me, O God, and know my heart. Search me, O God, and know my heart. That word search, and this is going to be very kind of academic, that word for search is literally the following, to probe and to explore, to probe and to explore. Now remember, if you were a Hebrew, someone might be, but if you were a Hebrew back in David's time, you must understand, you've heard me talk about this, so this is a reminder. If you were a Hebrew, you only saw mankind one way, and here's how you saw him. Let me use my Bible to illustrate, okay? To a Hebrew, there was only what you see and what's inside. What I mean is, like, to a Hebrew, the cover of this Bible would be the flesh. It'd be the me that you see, okay? To a Hebrew, though, the other part of the person is what's inside, and it consists of your mind, your will, your emotions, your spirit. It's all of the above. It's your heart. So it's what's inside and all of the above. So in other words, when Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he was not telling you those are all different compartments of your life. He was piling up descriptions of the inner man. You could literally translate it this way. Love the Lord your God with your whole being. Well, let me put it another way. When David is talking about being searched, and he's talking about his own personhood, he's thinking about the person you see, and then see if this works for you. The me that makes me me. Does that make any sense? In other words, the you that makes you you, that you won't let me see. Does that make sense? It's the part, it's, it's the whole part of you. And this is what we're talking about, the inner person. And before we go any further, we must all understand there are compartments in our lives. There are closets and drawers that we don't want the Lord messing with. We don't want, we, we, we do not want him to dig into that and there's a reason for that. The reason for that, well, it's one of two reasons. Either we want to own it and it's become an idol, that's the last two weeks, or we're afraid of him seeing it. That's the funny part. That's the really funny part. Because we're so afraid of what he's gonna see inside of us and the failures he's gonna see inside of us that he's gonna be mad at us and he's gonna stop liking us. When the truth of the matter is, there is nothing you can do to make him love you any more or any less than he already does. But there are many of us in this room who are so afraid of the Lord getting into our lives and seeing the failure and seeing the past and seeing the way I think and seeing the way that I really am that he's not gonna like us anymore. And the, the reality is he already sees you and knows you. And David is opening up for us a prayer that we must begin to pray. And David is saying, okay, God. And by the way, think about the David we're talking about. Let's think about it for just real quick, okay? We're not talking about a perfect dude, right? If you don't know the story, I'll quickly remind you. Sure, he killed giants, but he also seduced his best friend's wife. If you don't remember that he, by the way, Uriah was one of his best friends. Uriah was in David's company of mighty men. Yeah. 
the people who would give their lives for each other. And David seduces his wife, has a child by her, and has Uriah murdered in the battlefield. So before you sit there and think, God could not possibly want to do anything great in my life, consider who writes this prayer. Before you could sit there and say, there's no way he could look inside of me and want to show me great and mighty things, consider who prays this prayer. And before you're afraid of what the Lord might find in your life or what I'm afraid he might find in mine, consider the one who wrote this prayer and be willing, perhaps, to say, okay, God, probe deeply, search inside of me. David is literally saying, God, just open the whole thing up just peel back the curtains, open the drawers, fling open the closets, go into the garage. Father, go deeply, deeply into me. And there's a reason he's asking the Lord to go deeply. Let me show you another passage of scripture. Mark Psalm 139, so you don't lose it because we have to come back. And if you want to look at this, I think it'll come up on the screen for you, so you might want to just look there. James chapter four, James chapter four. Let me just read this to you. It's in verse seven. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. I've said this a lot this morning, but think about that. Just draw near. David says it this way. Okay, God, I'm, I'm going to lay open. I want you just to start searching and probing and exploring and I want to draw near to you. And here's the promise to you that maybe you needed to hear this morning. When you invite him to search and you draw near, there is not one part of God. And I'm talking to those of you who are followers of Jesus. There is never a moment when you draw near where he steps back and says, not yet. Never. And some of you have had that pain in your life. You've had that pain where you've tried to draw near and people have stiff-armed you. Or you try to draw near and say, and someone has given you a sense of trust, but the closer you got, they pushed you back. Remember, David's already reminded us, your precious thoughts towards me are all the time. And when he says, search me, oh God, search me, when I draw near, like James says, God always draws nearer. It's the story of the prodigal son. It's the story of our lives, because the Spirit of God is working longing to teach us what the Spirit of God wants us to know, and it will require an opening up and a drawing near. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Let me give you a definition for the word know that's in Psalm 139. It literally means to expose and to examine and bring to the front. To expose and to examine. But I'm not going to stay long there, okay? Because the passage says this, search me, so David prays what we need to pray. God, start exploring and start probing. And then he says, know me, start exposing and start examining. Remember, when God begins his work, sometimes he will draw things up for us to deal with, that he wants to deal with. More often than not, he wants to deal with us in the area of trusting him. He never brings things up to cause you to feel rejected or guilty. He may bring things up that cause sorrow. 2 Corinthians talks about godly sorrow brings about repentance. But Romans 8 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When I say, God, search me, know me, expose what's in me. Many of us have great fear that God is determined to humiliate us and ruin us because we still have this perception of God that he's this white-bearded, angry man on a throne that killed his son and cannot wait to whip me. Now, we wouldn't tell anybody that, but we're convinced that even though he will love you, and even, we're convinced that he would be gracious to our neighbor, but not to me. It's because I know the me that makes me me. You know the you that makes you you. And there's no way God could treasure this. And David lays that bare and says, you can search me. I can trust you. 
You can examine me, you can expose me, but listen to what he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Remember a minute ago, I told you that to a Hebrew, you were the outer person and the inner person. Let me read to you some definitions for the heart, for this word that David uses. Maybe some of these will resonate with you. It's the inner person, it's the seat of thought and emotion, it's the home of the conscience, it's courage, it's the mind, it's understanding. Let me, let me read that again, okay? So he says, search me and know my heart. The inner person, the seat of thought and emotion, the conscience, the place of courage, the mind, and understanding. I'll show you another passage of scripture related to that. If you're in Psalm 139, take a left-hand turn and go to Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51. Let's look at this prayer of David. Let's give it some more context. And then we'll look at one more word for the morning. Psalm 51, perhaps you've learned this prayer before. Psalm 51, verse 10. So you can see this is the heart of David in many ways. Psalm 51, verse 10. Psalm 51, verse 10 says, create in me, let me read it this way, create in me a brand new inner person. Create in me a new place of thought and emotion. The Apostle Paul says it this way, let our thoughts be made new, be transformed. Create in me a clean conscience. Create in me a clean place of courage. Create in me a clean mind. Create in me a clean place of understanding. It quite literally reads, create in me a clean heart. Oh God, Look at this prayer again, because this is a prayer. We're not gonna pray together at the end. That's stupid. We're not gonna all stand up and go, okay, everybody repeat this prayer after me, because half of us wouldn't mean it. And I don't mean that because you wouldn't mean it, but you need time to think about this in your own life. But at what point do I trust him enough to say, okay, God, I'm opened up. Every corner, every nook and cranny is yours. Search me, examine me, examine my heart every part of me. Remember, I started our time together saying, what would a revival look like? I don't believe a revival looks like a bunch of people outside, so to speak, being good people. I think a revival consists of those who call Jesus Savior, letting God probe deeply by his spirit and working in our lives. Psalm 139, verse 23, he says, search me, O God, know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Try me and know my thoughts. I'm going to park for the rest of the morning, and then we'll be done here pretty quickly on this word to try me. Let me give you a definition, okay? It is to take through the process in order to learn the genuineness of an object. Let me say that again. So when David says, try me, he's saying, take me through the grinder, so to speak, to demonstrate the genuineness of what's inside of me. In other words, refine me. So David says, what's he said so far? Okay, I'm open, I'm open. You get in, you examine the depths of who I am, and while you're in there, grind away. While you're in there, refine away. Let me show you another place in the Bible this word is used to try me, and maybe this will help you. You're in the, I'm gonna keep it in the book of Psalms, okay? So go to Psalm 66. Psalm 66, shouldn't be too hard to find, just to the left a little bit. Psalm 66. So David says, probe me, explore me, examine me, expose me, get down into the depths of the inner person, and by the way, go ahead and try me. Grind away to show the genuineness of what's inside of me. Psalm 66, find your way to verse 10. Some of you, a couple of you may be here this morning just because you need to see this verse. This is a, um, this is a hard few verses, but I'm going to read them to you. Verse 10. For you, O oh God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. Same word. This grinding away to show the genuineness of an object. This refining away that David's inviting. Okay. So he says, God, you, you have tested us. And, and you have tried us as silver is tried. Let's keep reading. You, that is you, O oh God, brought us into the net. That's not a good place, by the way. It's not a safety net. That's a, that's a reference to being caught, so to speak. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. Let me read that again because I don't want you to miss the pronoun. 
okay? You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. I just got to say, every time I read that, I think of James Taylor. I know it's different words, but anyways. We went through fire and through water, yet, now watch this, you have brought us out to a place of abundance. Now listen, this will be the last place we are this morning. David says, I'm open, peel it open, probe me, your spirit is inside of me, may your spirit do its work. Examine me and go deep into who I am. And then David says, I will trust you to try me even though people ride over our heads and there's a burden on our back because you are taking me through a season to lead me to a place of abundance. But the question remains for you and the question remains for me. And I'm not just saying you and me so you think I'm jiving with you. You know, we're cool together. I'm saying this is a prayer I have to decide to pray to say, okay, God, All bets are off. I am all in and you can search every part and you can have every nook, you can have every cranny, you can have every junk drawer, every relationship. I trust you, even though I am terrified. I don't think you would like me. I'm afraid you'll hurt me. And yet David says, I trust you. And I invite you to try me to bring me to a place of abundance. There's some other things we'll look into as we go through this passage of scripture. We'll we'll look at verse 24 the next time we're together where it says, and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. And there's so much for us to learn in that passage. But I ask you just a final question this morning. Do you trust him enough to invite him to search you? Do you trust him enough to allow him to get into every corner because he will not bust doors down? He will not force drawers open, so to speak, because there are many that we just keep holding on to. One day he might break us of them, but for now, would you invite him? It's easier to pray for wicked people. It's much harder to sit down as someone who's a follower of Jesus and say, okay, God, Your spirit lives inside of me, so get inside and dig deep and expose what's hurting me and examine my heart and get deep inside of me. And by the way, while you're there, go ahead and try me. And not try me like, try me. Like, refine me, Lord. Refine me and lead me to a place of abundance. We'll look at the rest next week. Let's pray together. So in in an attitude of prayer, I want to remind you that many people after the first service just left prayers here on the stage or met with people down here in the front. I invite you to do that, even though it's hard to get down here sometimes. Father, I thank you for this prayer of David. It's easier to pray for, at least it is for me, it's a lot easier to pray for other people to get their act together than to sit down with the Spirit of God inside of us and say, okay, God, game over. You start searching. It's a season of preparation, and I ask you to start searching. And as we'll look at next week, some very specific things that I need you to show me. But individually, in our own way, if we choose to um, take on this, this prayer, we ask you to dig deep into who we are, Show us who you want us to be and what you're going to do in our lives. And we trust you with your examination and with your probing. And we trust you with our hearts and with our lives, knowing that you love us, that you think of us at all times, and there's nothing we can do to cause you to love us less or love us more. Thank you again for this morning. And uh, may we be salt and light Monday through Saturday, so the world would see God, you working through us, that they might give glory to the Lord and might themselves come to Jesus. Search us and know us and try us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for being here. Hopefully we'll see you next week.